You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. The following podcast is scheduled for one fall. Coming in at 195 pounds from Studio A, he is the reigning, defending, undisputed host of the Ring of Thunder, Sexy Sexy. Thor! What's up, Thunderverse? We now start with some pro wrestling turbo news going into Freaky Friday as this card starts to take shape. Due to uncontrollable circumstances, Big Game James will be unable to compete at Freaky Friday. Instead, Joshua Cutshaw will defend the Pro Wrestling Turbo Championship against the big man on campus, TJ Boss. And now the one who will face Mad Dog Josh Powers in the Mad Dog Mayhem match is none other than James D. Drake, a.k.a. J.D. Drake of the Wingmen in AEW. And if... That's not enough star power for you. It was just announced just today on the 18th that Savannah Evans will be dropping back in from her time at Impact Wrestling to face former Pro Wrestling Turbo Champion Patrick Scott. Those two previously had a clash in a six-person tag match. The last time Pro Wrestling Turbo was at Brewery 85, and now they'll be going one-on-one. And if you think this is the last match we're going to announce of Savannah Evans in this podcast, then you are mistaken, but you will have to wait to the end of the podcast. So on Raw, start out with the Usos challenging Big E and Drew McIntyre who are set to face each other for the WWE Championship at Crown Jewel. And things have been pretty tense between Big E and Drew, but they agreed to put their differences aside because the Usos must be here on behalf of the Tribal Chief because Roman will supposedly have to deal with E come Survivor Series and Drew will be a member of the SmackDown roster effective this Friday. So yeah, these are two people that he kind of needs to look out for. And then E and Drew had a moment where they shook hands like the Mega Powers, Hogan and Savage. So that was pretty neat. And then there was the that tag match that I was so excited for, Becky and Charlotte versus Bianca and Sasha. And it didn't really happen at all, and it was more just like a fatal four-way with a tag team intermission which just ended when the ref threw it out after Sasha had enough and just hit Bianca with the backstabber. And and then, yeah, the ref just threw it out right there. And Drew and E versus the Usos was kind of the same way, but I think had a non-finish because the good guys, like, they turned on each other at some point. I don't know. Raw's just confusing plus also i was getting real sleepy towards the end so i paused it and just went to bed and then when i woke up i think it was in the middle of the night i turned it back on and watched it and i'm still a little fuzzy on what happened but i know it pretty much ended the same way as the women's tag match and speaking of becky and bianca There was a part of Becky's interview on the Out of Character podcast with Ryan Satin, who's the guy who covers WWE for Fox Sports, that I want to double down on when they talked about SummerSlam and her beating Bianca Belair in 26 seconds. And let me just try to replicate the quote as best I can. I know a lot of people were upset and were like, well, if they were going to do this, then they should have had a long match. Well, if we have a long match and I beat her, then I just beat her. You know what I mean? And that's not good. That's not good for her. But if she's robbed and we take something from her and she doesn't expect it, then we want to see her succeed. Oh, we want to see her succeed. We don't want the person with it to have it anymore. We want that person to succeed and we want that more than I think we're doing just fine. And patting myself on the back because I think I pretty much nailed Becky's inflections and stuff. 
in that quote without having to try to do a horrible Irish accent. So, yeah. But yeah, with that whole explanation, I mean, it just makes logical sense to me. I don't know how many of you are actually still pissed about it, but hey, maybe you're the lucky ones because you were worked in the way that match was intended to work you. I won't say I saw where it was going, but I figured it was going to go somewhere along those lines. But I was mostly just doing cartwheels and somersaults all over the place because Becky came back. And if that somehow makes you even more mad that I was just happy that Becky was back, then sorry, get a real problem. And I'm glad to assist in the working of emotions you're supposed to feel towards big time Bex. It's similar, I would say, to SummerSlam 2018 when it all started for the man. I mean, if Becky had just been beaten straight up by Carmella, or if Becky had been inserted after Carmella and Charlotte was already established, then it wouldn't have worked the same way. It couldn't have. Becky had her opportunity for a one-on-one at SummerSlam to become two-time SmackDown Women's Champion, and then Charlotte went ahead and got inserted into that too and then won the damn thing. Becky felt robbed. We were pissed because we wanted Becky to have it, and Charlotte just swooped in and took it. And after the slap heard around the world, then we strapped in and rode all the way to her meteoric rise to WrestleMania 35 and the dominance that followed to her relinquishing the title after Money in the Bank the following year. Difference is... Management has hindsight in this present day case because Becky was supposed to be a heel after that slap in 2018, but that fell through in the best way. And now they're doing a bit of a better job turning her heel now, but uh, only kind of. She started to get booze for a little while after that, but lately it sounded like nothing but cheers. If there are booze, then they're the farthest thing from deafening. So that's some perspective for you that nobody asked for, at least from me. And honestly, I don't even know if it's going to convince people who are like not sure because as I've seen lately, people would just rather sort of believe the narrative that people on the internet have told them about a thing instead of just watching the thing and just sort of making up their own mind from there and yeah, whatever. I'm I'm just through explaining it because honestly, I'm recording this a, a little late and I want to go get some fucking mo's now. But Ring of Thunder absolutely must happen. You cannot have one without the other. And then also Mansoor and Mustafa Ali broke up their tag team and they will face each other at Crown Jewel. And regardless of what you think about Crown Jewel, the way Mustafa Ali puts it is they're getting to be what they always wanted to see growing up watching WWE, which is two Muslim wrestlers facing each other for the first time on a WWE pay-per-view, which this is the first time ever that that's actually happening. So good on them. I really hope and I have no doubt that they will absolutely smash it on Thursday. And then uh, shame on me for not having not run down the Halloween Havoc card so far for you. Which by the way Halloween Havoc returns for NXT 2.0 on October 26th on TV. And the lineup card so far is Tommaso Ciampa versus Braun Breaker for the NXT Championship. And this past Tuesday, Ciampa defeated Joe Gacy to prevent Gacy from getting in on the match and making this a triple threat. And Raquel Gonzalez versus Mandy Rose for the NXT Women's Championship. And it'll be a spin the wheel and make the deal match. And that'll decide the stipulation. And Io Shirai and Zoe Stark versus Gigi Dolan and JC Jane, also of Toxic Attraction, versus Indy Hartwell and Persia Parada for the NXT Women's Tag Team Championship. And there was a teaser going on last week for somebody apparently burying their past and coming to NXT. Maybe it's, I don't know, Elias? And in the main event this past Tuesday of NXT... Isaiah Swerve Scott defeated Santos Escobar despite Legato having kidnapped Hit Row in the parking lot because the NXT parking lot is the most dangerous place in all the sports entertainment. 
And Escobar went back on his promise that Legato will stay in the back because they still ended up like jumping on the apron and doing some stuff. But Swerve defeated Santos anyway. <clears throat> and he was planning on taking the North American Championship with him to SmackDown because Hit Row will be debuting on SmackDown effective this Friday, of course. Until Carmelo Hayes and Trick Williams came out with the title shot contract that Hayes won in the NXT breakout tournament. He cashed it in like a money in the bank sort of thing, which that's the first time ever. I mean, it's only been used twice. The contract won in the NXT breakout tournament. Remember Jordan Miles? Yeah, he cashed it in on Adam Cole and Adam Cole defeated him, but I think elevated him and, but other problems transpired outside of the ring that made sure that Jordan Miles did not become a NXT superstar. And then he cashed it in like money in the bank. Swerve kicked out of his first special move and penny attempt, but Hayes got him on the second try as the new NXT North American champion. And when we get back from commercials, SmackDown and a whole bunch of AEW. Star Trek is a vision. Great storytelling. My favorite TV show of all time. I really love it, and it's so much fun. Join our crew aboard Earth Station Trek for your regular podcast escape into the Trekverse. Make what? it so. Let's see what's out there. What? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought we all agreed to say make it so. No, let's go, it's fun. But make it so is iconic. It's classic. It's too iconic. So we're all going to do make it so? No. <laughs> How did watchdog groups with no experience in television take a controlling interest on Saturday morning television? When did Wonder Woman make her animated debut? Want to know why there were two competing Ghostbuster shows? How Atari changed the Saturday morning landscape? How did networks compete over similar genres at the same time? Find out all of this and more on the Best Saturdays of Our Lives podcast. A proud member of the ESO Network. Hello. Have you ever wondered how much Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster sold Superman's rights to DC for? Or which uh, popular football star was uh, the Sam Wilson the Falcons physical appearance based on? You can find all that and more at the History of Comic Books podcast, a podcast dedicated to the creators, events, history, and the companies that made the great comic book medium. Hosted and created by your friendly neighborhood, J.T. Wheatley. Please listen, give it a listen at iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, and all our po- podcasting platforms. Thank you, and go ahead and enjoy yourself a good comic book. Hey guys, gals, and non-binary pals. It's Amanda Bones. And I'm Ashley. Of How to Talk to Your Friend About Wrestling, the podcast on the Count Out Wrestling Podcast Network, a weekly show where we talk about all of our favorite things, babes, blood, and brutality. We also talk about other fun things, like is Kenny Omega finally too tan? And how much blood is too much blood? Because that looks like way too much blood. So join us on the adventure of teaching me, Amanda Bones, about wrestling. Do you like podcasts? Then you're going to hate Thunder Talk. Tasteless subject matter. Mature humor. Contempt for our co-hosts. Unapologetic social views. Edgy music. And total irreverence for the nerd junk we love. Are all reasons why no one. No one. No one should listen to Thunder Talk. Find us on the ESO Network and all podcasting platforms. Or don't. Whatever. A few key highlights from SmackDown. Edge and Seth Rollins both got separate promos. And Edge said that he will, he, if he would do like Seth did, which, I mean, he technically did and even referenced when he did the same thing years before to John Cena and went to his house and slapped Cena's dad. Uh, he'd be like, yeah, you know, me and Bex have some unresolved issues. That being when Becky first became the man and was still supposed to be a bad guy and became SmackDown Women's Champion. The Edge had her on his Cutting Edge talk show. Or was it Razor's Edge? I don't know. And he tried to warn her about, you know, be, being a champion, but still pushing away all your friends and just ending up alone and Becky was just like 
yeah, whatever, get out of my ring and don't fall on your neck on the way out. Ooh. So it's just like, yeah, me and Bex have some unfinished business. To which, of course, afterwards, Becky posted on Twitter the picture of her raising her championship while Edge was just sitting there like, ugh. And then Seth Rollins came out and did his promo later on in the show. And his suit, I think half of it was like clubs or spades or something. And the other half was diamonds. And the thing was the diamonds were the color scheme of like red, black, and white. So it looked like Harley Quinn's symbol and the crowd caught on to this quickly because like half the crowd was chanting Harley Quinn for a while. And of course, as you can imagine, it being my brand, I enjoyed the shit out of that. And then the Usos defeated the Street Profits in a street fight to retain the SmackDown Tag Team Championship. And even though we've seen this time and time and time and time again... I mean, all four of these guys are just so good. It's just like, screw it. I can keep watching this. And, of course, you know we're going to see that again here in the coming months because the New Day is coming back to SmackDown. So we're going to get plenty of Usos versus New Day, which I'm fine with. I mean, you know how much I love uh, throwbacks to the old 2018 year. And yeah, I saw lots of Usos versus New Day during that particular time. So, yep, going to see them run it back and or them breaking off in a singles competition, that being New Day, and seeing Kofi and or Woods have universal championship programs with Roman Reigns, which again, yeah, sign me up for that shit right there. And in the second to last segment which was like i think that's when we started getting commercial free because the last half hour of smackdown was commercial free gosh i wonder why but sasha banks defeated becky lynch only because bianca used her hair to smack becky's hand from the rope and then sasha hit her with a backstabber and pinned her which That's the first time I've ever seen Sasha Banks pin somebody off of a backstabber alone, so I call shenanigans, but still fucking fantastic match. I had high expectations for it because, of course, I mean, it's Becky Lynch versus Sasha Banks. How am I not going to have high expectations for it? And I was very much satisfied. You should always go out of your way to watch that and or watch Becky Lynch versus Sasha Banks at Hell in a Cell 2019. (laughs) Which, by the way, Seth definitely referenced that in his promo in that episode while he was wearing his Harley Quinn suit, because he said, I've been in Hell in a Cell, and it's made me the man I am today. Which is exactly true, because Hell in a Cell was a major point of the fans turning on him, which thus brought about his heel turn at the end of the year, so... He's not wrong at all. In fact, he's so not wrong, he's exactly right. It, that's just not a, you know, him just being theatrical or exaggerating. It's a fact. And then the final segment was Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar signing the contract for their Universal Championship match at Crown Jewel. And then, you know, Roman signed it and then handed it to Brock. And Brock's just... He didn't even look at it. He just signed the whole damn paper, it seemed like. And Roman was just like, what are you doing, Brock? Why would you do something so stupid as to just sign that contract without reading it? And then Brock was like, no, I read it this morning with my advocate, Paul Heyman. And then that was just the mic droppiest moment Because Roman was just looking like, he was looking stunned and pissed. Paul Heyman was just like afraid for his life. The whole crowd was just like, oh shit. And then Brock Lesnar just, you know, started, got out of the ring and just started walking to the back like, ha 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 ha. And what's interesting is Paul Heyman put on Instagram today. He's just like, 
you know, at Crown Jewel, I will be walking out with the reigns and defending undisputed universal heavyweight champion of the world. Or, now he was offering this as a spoiler, by the way. And he said, and I will be leaving Crown Jewel with the universal heavyweight champion. But he didn't specify that it was Roman Reigns. So, hmm. This should be very, very interesting. And while all this was going on, <clears throat> this episode of AEW Rampage had its own little buy-in on show on YouTube, which they usually have for the pay-per-views. But, I mean, I guess, you know, they're just looking to compete with SmackDown here. And the first match was Ty Conti defeating Santana Garrett. Bobby Fish got his first AEW win against Lee Moriarty. And then... A frickin' 20-minute epic was Brian Danielson defeating Minoru Suzuki. And hold on now. While this was going on, <laughs> Taz made a remark like, if you're watching TV instead of watching this, you're an idiot. And of course, I mean, if you don't think he's referring to SmackDown, then, I mean, come on. And uh, I was thinking, okay, look, Taz... Fucking Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks are a fucking badass too. And that was a really fantastic match as well. And of course, the Tribal Chief signing the contract against Brock Lesnar. I'm just like, it's okay. I'm, I, I will watch this on YouTube later because I definitely would not miss Brian Danielson versus Suzuki. But still, yeah, all around great match. I've just thrown so much amazing fucking wrestling into my eyeballs this weekend. Oof. And I know Roman made some comments in an interview about CM Punk and AEW and saying was, he's only seen like a clip or two of CM Punk's matches. And he, he said he looks like he lost a step and he wouldn't wrestle him because it wouldn't because CM Punk wouldn't it wouldn't elevate him. And He's not wrong. And he also said that you know, AEW's just like he doesn't really see them as competition because, you know, they're designed to appeal to the hardcore wrestling fan base while WWE tries to appeal to everybody. And I feel like he's wrong and right about WWE appealing to everybody because they do try to diversify and throw in a lot of entertainment, not just pro wrestling. But also with some of their fucking booking decisions, they also alienate a lot of people too. So, you know, I can't fully agree or disagree with Roman on that one. But yeah, and it will be interesting to see like how AEW decides to grow and expand throughout the years because he's not wrong that it appeals to that hardcore wrestling fan base. And he said, so they already have a ceiling and a built-in ground, so... It'll be interesting. I'm I'm not sure how I couldn't tell you either which way because I think <laughs> I haven't really seen this through a casual fan's eyes or had a casual fan's eyes since twenty eighteen, I think. I think I went from casual fan to definitely hardcore fan, I don't know, sometime in twenty nineteen, probably after Raw Lanta. And if I'm incorrect and I was still in like casual fan mode in 2019 because I just watched WWE because Dynamite didn't even exist yet and Impact wasn't on Access TV yet, then uh, I dare say I definitely hit that hardcore wrestling fan status during those five months of being unemployed during the beginning of COVID when I was watching Raw and AEW Dark, and <clears throat> Impact, and NXT, and Dynamite, and NXT UK, and SmackDown, and 205 Live, and every other fucking pay-per-view and special that would come on. So yeah, I think definitely probably then I'd... Oh, and also reformatted my solo podcast to be definitely a wrestling podcast and have done it 
every week before that since October 2018 and definitely every week since this became Ring of Thunder. So yeah, that's why I love AEW just fine. But also trying to think of it, yeah, maybe it does. It might have a ceiling or it might not. I mean, Tony Khan has definitely has a unique kind of brain, so he could probably figure out how to appeal more to casual fans. But anyway, in the main Rampage show, CM Punk defeated Matt Seidel, and it was commercial-free, same time as uh, the remaining of Becky and Sasha in the contract signing. And then Ruby Soho defeated the Bunny with a backslide pin and then was punched in the face by Penelope Ford with brass knuckles. <clears throat> The Men of the Year and Junior Dos Santos defeated Chris Jericho, Sammy Guevara, and Jake Hager. And then later on Dynamite, there was a great promo battle, which led to the challenge of a five-on-five -five of Inner Circle versus Men of the Year slash America's Top Team. And then one definitely really cool thing of that happened on Dynamite, which was overall a great episode. Arn brought Cody to the Nightmare Factory and had quite an intervention involving him going soft and all Hollywood, and the likes of Dustin Rhodes, Lee Johnson, Brock Anderson, Red Velvet, and Kylan King were telling Cody what they thought of him now, and did some tough love training with him to get him back to the standard that the Rhodes family have held themselves to. And Arn told Cody when his dad wrestled Arn years ago and messed him up and made him get 30 stitches in his head, the kids didn't think, oh, poor Arn, because they knew he had it coming, and Arn told Cody that Malachi Black has the same thing co coming. Cody Rhodes versus Malachi Black 3 will be happening this Saturday on Dynamite, and I have no idea where that's going. And then that main event of that, we had Brian Danielson versus uh, Bobby Fish, and that was another wonderful little 15-20 minute match, somewhere around that ballpark, of which Brian Danielson was victorious in the end. And then real quickly after that, they announced the AEW World Title Eliminator Bracket, which the finals will be taking place during full gear, and the winner of that will face the winner of Kenny Omega versus Hangman Page for the World Championship at a later date. No, oh, well, Page versus Omega is taking place at full gear, and then the winner of that tournament will face them at a later date. And on one side of be the Dark Orders 10, Preston Vance versus John Moxley, Orange Cassidy versus Powerhouse Hobbs, Dustin Rhodes versus Brian Danielson, and Lance Archer versus Eddie Kingston. And then So that'll be all that'll be starting this coming Friday on Rampage and we'll be going through and of course the finals will be taking place on the full gear pay-per-view November 13th. And real quick to run down some new developments on the card for Impact's Bound for Glory, which will be this Saturday, the 23rd. The Inspiration, Cassie Lee and Jesse McKay, will be taking on Rosemary and Havoc of Decay for the Knockouts Tag Team Championship. And then Heath requested a tag match with Rhino versus Violent by Design because he's been trying to, now that he's healthy again and has actually signed his Impact contract after a whole year almost a year of being out and waiting on that so he went to scott demore and he was just like look i gotta have faith in my friend so book me and rhino versus violent by design and if if rhino doesn't show up then fine i'll go down fighting violent by design that is fine so that's what we have and we'll see if rhino shows up and the winners of the three triple threats to qualify for the Triple threat at Bound for Glory for the vacant X Division Championship is Steve Macklin versus El Fantasma versus Trey Miguel. By the way, I've definitely been jamming out that Bullet Club theme for about half a week now. And then there was a battle royal for to determine who's placed at number one and who's placed at number 20 in the Call Your Shot gauntlet. And it came down to Chris Saban and W. Morrissey. And W. Morrissey threw out Chris Saban to 
get the number 20 spot, which is the very last spot in the gauntlet match. And Chris Saban will be coming in at number one, I do believe. And this isn't at uh, Bound for Glory, but this will be coming on this Thursday on Impact. But as part of the whole pick your poison thing, it's in the feud between Mickey James and Deanna Perrazzo. Uh, Mick or Deanna picked Savannah Evans to go up against Mickey James. So that will be the match going down on Thursday, which is all leading up to. Deanna Perrazzo and Mickey James finally facing each other for the Knockouts Championship. And of course, along on top of that, we have Christian Cage versus Josh Alexander for the Impact World Championship. <clears throat> and before I leave you today, before I forget, because I almost forgot it, because it's the it's the semifinals for or no, Raw had the first round or the remaining first round, and then SmackDown had part of the semifinals. But on Raw, Kofi Kingston was actually defeated by Jinder Mahal, just how I predicted, because there was some interference from Veer and Shanky, and Jinder eventually caught him, caught Kofi with the Coloss and got the 1-2-3, so he will be advancing. And Xavier Woods defeated Ricochet, and Xavier Woods... Of course, will be advancing, so it'll be Woods versus Jinder Mahal tonight. And the winner will be facing Finn Balor, who defeated Sami Zayn on SmackDown at Crown Jewel. And the winner, of course, will be King of the Ring. Let let it be Xavier Woods, please. But of course, thinking about Finn Balor going from the prince to the king, like that would be some real evolution right there. It is a mystery. Oh. And especially as not as a human, Finn Balor is the prince, and as the demon, Finn Balor is the demon king. By the way, I'm still waiting to hear about uh, the demon versus the cameraman who cut that rope at Extreme Rules. I, I need something to develop from that. And then, oh yeah, and I already said Finn Balor defeated Sami Zayn. And on the Queen's, Queen's Crown Tournament side... Shayna Baszler did defeat um, but, but, uh, Dana Brooke, and Dewdrop did defeat Natalia. So it'll be Shayna Baszler versus Dewdrop in the semifinals. And on the women's side, we already had uh, Carmella facing Zelina Vega in the semifinals. And Zelina came up to her and was just like, you don't need the mask tonight. I won't hit you in the face. Just don't hit me in mine. And of course, you know, I felt a little wink, wink, nudge, nudge there. So they had that. <clears throat> they started having a very, very technical match. Pretty impressive until Carmella got Zelina in the face with a super kick. So Zelina just like hopped on her and started wailing on her and Carmella rolled out of the ring to get her mask. But instead of the people who were, her, who were usually there waiting with her mask, it was Liv Morgan with the mask and Carmella was just like, uh, nope. So she ended up going back to the ring. Zelina Vega rolled her up for the one, two, three and Zelina We'll be facing the winner of Shayna and Dewdrop at Crown Jewel, and we'll, for the, the 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 right to be called the first woman to be crowned queen in the Queen's Crown Tournament, obviously. So, with all that said, that's the one, two, three. Thanks for locking up with me in the Ring of Thunder. Kick butts, not nuts. Welcome to Doctor Geek's Laboratory. Dr. Geek here with another reminder that the ESO Network is pro-science and pro-vaccine. We urge you to be a superhero and protect yourself, your family, and your fellow geeks around the world. Don't be fooled by the forces of evil and their anti-science misinformation campaign. Consult the latest CDC guidelines, your doctor, and get the COVID vaccine today. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. 
Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.